Sub Tank Nerds, bloody here. If you enjoy these videos, please consider hitting the like and subscribe. Today we're going to be covering one of my least favourite topics, British tank design and British armoured vehicle design. Specifically, we're going to be having a look at the internals, as it would appear that British designers hate mechanics like myself. When working on vehicles as long as I have, you start to develop a list in your head of all the brilliant ideas that engineers are capable of. You also form a list of all the dumb ideas that they're capable of, many of which are going to be found in this video, specifically the British ones. Sit back and relax while we go and have a look at these awful ideas together. The vehicles currently presented to you are all unique. There are wheeled vehicles, tracked vehicles, scout cars, combat reconnaissance, APCs, and artillery. The sheer quantity of variants ensures that there is almost always a vehicle for every job. In order to produce so many different variants, however, many of these vehicles share a shockingly large amount of parts. Ordinarily, this isn't an issue. Using similar parts on different vehicles is a tried and true method used by virtually every industry in the world. There can be downsides to this approach, however. If certain design flaws show up, they can hinder the manufacturing process. Even if they are put into production, the issues are normally ironed out in at least a year or two. That is, unless you're British, with an inflated ego due to having been on the winning side of a world war, their intellect has appeared to have somewhat dulled. As such, most of their post-war vehicles are all plagued by the same smooth brain ideas that now make them infamous among the collectors of today. I'm not salty, you're salty, because if instead of buying a proper tank or armoured car, you decided to buy a ferret, the poor man's armoured car. Now you sit there wondering why an irate Australian YouTuber is calling you out, as you sit there in your tank hitting the star button for the millionth time, you know as well as I do that no amount of praying will fix it. But it's okay. It's only the starter motor. <laughs> now look, I get it. Having someone insult your hobbies, it's not a great feeling. But when someone says that you need to remove the engine to get to the starter motor, your cute little armoured car doesn't seem that great anymore. Jokes aside, British vehicles do actually have a rather lengthy number of issues, often stemming from poor design choices, like the aforementioned starter motor. For those not savvy with cars, starter motors are essentially just a small electric motor that actually kicks over the engine. While it's entirely possible to hill start or push start a car in the event of a starter motor failure, vehicles that are too heavy to push or have the wrong style of transmission cannot be started without a starter motor. Unfortunately, this applies to most armoured vehicles. No matter how well you look after a vehicle, you're going to have to replace, or at the very least fix, certain parts. Typically, it's going to be some part of the electric system that needs replacing first. And starter motors are certainly not an exception. With the heavy current load running through them in order to start a vehicle, they're very prone to burning out. As well as in certain conditions, the internals can corrode, causing them to lock up. So, dear viewers, I present to you a question. Where would you find a starter motor on a British armoured vehicle? We'll start with the easy one. A British 432 armoured personnel carrier. This is the Mark I with a straight 8 petrol engine in it. Still can't see it? 
Why don't we try looking at the other side? No, I guess it's not there either. I guess we're gonna have to look through the side access panel. Oh, there it is. You can't see it. How about now? What a perfectly reasonable place to put the starter motor. Fortunately, there's an access panel here. It makes the job just a little bit easier. It sure would be a shame if they got rid of this on later models. Oops. I guess that raises our next question. What's the easiest way of getting it out? See, only a minor inconvenience. I must admit though, the engine sounds amazing without the exhaust. Up next, we're going to have a look at this CVRT family of vehicles. We've already seen a few of the engines of these taken out. They're a straight six double overhead cam petrol engine. Let's see if they learned from their last mistake. Ooh. Again, we're not really seeing any progress. Here's a fun little fact for you. After a while, the Raimis actually cut holes in the driver's side firewall just to access the starter motor. Let's look at one more. This is the Saracen Armoured Car. It utilises almost the exact same engine as the 432 that we previously looked at. Given that's the case, the starter motor should be located on the left hand side of the engine. In order to fix the 432, we actually removed the starter motor from this particular vehicle. And I can promise you, it was not fun. Of all the vehicles we've talked about so far, Saracens are probably the easiest to remove the starter motor from. Simply remove the armoured engine deck coverings, take away the air filter and all attaching hoses, remove the cowlings for the air filter, as well as the change pedal cowlings within the driver's compartment and all associated bolts. We've gone on starter motors long enough. How about the other issues plaguing these vehicles? While we're on the Saracen, let's talk about it and its sister, the Saladin. Aside from armor, a large gun, and a few design changes, these two vehicles utilize almost the exact same parts. They share the same 160 horsepower straight 8 Rolls Royce B80 engine, which also utilizes the same twin barrel carbies as that on the CVRTs. Their most defining feature, however, is their six wheels. These utilize all the same components for steering and suspension. If you are worried, however, that what you are dealing with is not a genuine Saladin or Saracen, you need only to look at the wheels. Only the most astute of observers will notice the tiny indications of oil behind the wheels. If the vehicle you are looking at does not possess these small indicators, it may not be British or it's run out of oil. These helpful tips can also be used to identify ferrets and Land Rovers.
You knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. We all knew this was coming. Anything to do with British electrics is bad. It's practically a meme at this point and always has been. I'm not really gonna bother wasting too much time with this. If you don't quite understand the reference, if you're too young or you haven't worked on enough British vehicles to know better, simply Google Lucas, the Prince of Darkness. For our last topic of discussion, at least for this video, I decided to ask my mentor Peter if he had any insights into British engineering. He had this to say regarding the cooling system on the engines and the assembly using studs rather than bolts. These ones have nuts on the top, then you've got to slide the cylinder head off, off the studs. They've got coolant running through it, so you've got a cast iron block, you've got steel bolts and you've got aluminium head. So you've got three different metals and they all corrode and stick to one another, so you undo all the nuts and bolts, can't get the cylinder head off. <laughs> so you have to cut it into slices to get the cylinder head off the block. They most have the cylinder head bolts that go down. Yeah. Right? Not these engines, they've got studs. Yeah, yeah. That go up and they run through the water gallery and they rust, so you can't get the cylinder head off, so you have to cut it off with an oxy torch. Like, why do they do that? So there you have it. Just a small snippet of the many issues plaguing British vehicles. This was just a look into the more modern vehicles. However, we will at some point in the future look at the older World War II examples. And no, I have not forgotten Dear Chieftain. We'll be having a look at that monstrosity in its own video. For now, I bid you farewell. If you liked the video, please be sure to hit the like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Stay nerdy tankies. <laughs>